Before I start the podcast, I'd like to give a brief content warning. I'm going to be discussing transphobia and racism. If that's something that you don't really want to hear about, then I won't be offended if you skip this episode. Hello, welcome back, or welcome to the You Look Like a Badger podcast. My name is Amber and I am your host. Every month, I like to discuss an aspect of queer cinema under different genres. This month, as you might know, is June, which is Pride Month. I have to be honest, I've had a pretty terrible Pride Month for various reasons, most of them personal. So <laughs> I do consider this to be incredibly homophobic um, and I would like my money back. <laughs> I will say this that I've looked forward to recording this does give me a place to focus my energy and talk about queer stuff. So for Pride, for the month of June, I decided to look at documentaries just to look at the historical perspective of the LGBT movement. So I'm going to be looking at the documentary, The Queen. My name is Jack. Well, my mother calls me Jack. Everybody that cares about me calls me Jack. That's, that's my name. But I work under the name of Sabrina. And all the queens all call me Sabrina whenever I see them. I go up to this queen and I say, what's your name? The queen says, Monique. And you say, that, that's marvelous, darling, but what was your name before? And the queen will look at you straight in the eye and say, there was no before. The Queen is a 1968 documentary that takes the audience behind the scenes of Miss All-America Camp Beauty Pageant in New York. Very matter of fact, the film portrays the camaraderie and conflict of the queer people doing drag at a time where it was less acceptable to do so. It grounds the art form in its musicality and is sure to differentiate between those transitioning and those who use drag as a form of expression and creative outlet. This film has a 96% critic score and a 64% audience score on Rotten Tomatoes and a 3.8 on Letterboxd, so relatively positively received, so that's good. I do love when a documentary about gay people is well received because it means it's not going to be outrageously offensive, particularly, you know, coming from the 60s when it definitely could have been more. I don't have as many reviews this time around, mainly because the reviews I went to go look at kind of bold the ending because the ending is probably the most memorable part of the documentary and we will talk about it but I didn't want to give it away in this section which is meant to be spoiler free. I did manage to get one so this one is from Liz. They say that the film is an amazing portrait of pre-Stonewall pageant drag culture. Paris is Burning is the obvious comparison but this feels much more like a Maisel's film for better and for worse. I'm amazed that I'd never heard of this before. Many of the reviews were comparing it to Paris is Burning mainly because Paris is Burning is like the successor that builds upon what is a very informative template. So the film is very matter of fact, just kind of shoots it. It does have some talking head sequences in it, but it is mostly just people getting ready and then you see the pageant and its aftermath. So from here on out, I will be going into spoilers. So if you haven't seen the film and would like to and feel like listening to this podcast would ruin the experience, then go and watch it and then come back. Do you think she, she is not this? beautiful, has no qualifications, you think body she body Did you think she deserved it? Darling, she didn't deserve Answer nothing. Answer me. You're not speaking from the damn camera. You have a mind. Do you think she deserved it? You know she didn't deserve it. All of them, the judges knew it too. But she was terrible. You know she and her explanation it. for why she wanted the money to put it in the bank. <laughs> She's not getting any money because Sabrina is not going to pay her. They're good friends. It's only publicity and it's bad publicity for Holland and all the rest because I'm declared as one of the uglier people of the world. She better get the hell back to Philadelphia because she's one of the worst. And where's Miss Sabrina? Because I'll sue the bitch. Did you sign I will sue. No, I didn't sign any release. And if she releases any bitch on me, I will sue the fool. She won't make money off of my name, darling. She can make it off of Harlow and all the rest of the fools that will flock to her. But not Crystal, darling. Anybody but her. I think that 
a good place to start would be mainly because i haven't talked about documentaries on this podcast before would be to just talk about what the function of a documentary would be and what it is in relation to representing lgbt culture bill nichols says that documentaries can contribute to efforts to uphold the dominant ideology of any given moment or they can work to contest alter or subvert it to do either they must be persuasive, capable of garnering belief for the solution or perspective they propose. I think that's a good place to start because I think some people have the idea that documentaries just are. And I know in the introduction to this, I was talking about how the Queen is very matter of fact. But if I take one thing away from studying film at university is that Every single film, from the second you choose to place the camera in a certain place, from when you get into the editing booth and you choose to cut parts out and put them in a different order, you are manipulating that footage. It stops being objective. The second that you place the camera here instead of over there, and you place the image within that frame, you are in control of what is being put across. What Nichols is talking about, how documentaries have this kind of power to uphold or subvert dominant ideology, in the same way that this film has the power to just represent gay and trans people in like a quote-unquote normal way as in they're not they're not necessarily being demonized or villainized a documentary has the power to do the complete opposite and that is down to the filmmaker how queer people are represented i have a quote from richard bartone who discusses the queer documentary specifically and he says the queer community has aggressively used documentary film to resurrect historical memory and to permit the marginalized to bear witness as well as to build an image base that reflects our diversity and counters distorted and misleading representations. The second thing to assert when discussing documentaries is how they can be used to not only persuade, uphold or contest dominant ideology, but specifically to re-evaluate and refocus historical moments that if it were up to dominant ideology, e.g. heteronormativity and cisnormativity, they would be forgotten. So the documentary can be incredibly powerful in multiple ways. In this instance, with the Queen, it is showing us a point in history where it would be a lot more difficult to be transgressive in terms of gender expression than today. And <laughs> I am going to say this because if you have been following the news it is not easy today that's not what i'm asserting that's not what i'm trying to say if you live in the uk or just follow uk politics you will be aware the incredible amount of transphobia that's currently going on so i'm not suggesting that it's easier now but at a time where it was just more acceptable to hate people just for doing drag is vastly different to the current moment where one of the biggest reality TV shows is about people doing drag. And I am going to discuss that certain TV show later on. I will be concise. A queer documentary has the power to recenter queer voices and as a result of that persuade people who might be adverse to gay and trans people to be more sympathetic or at least be more open to understanding and um, that is the power that any any film can have so let's let's discuss the actual documentary as i have said multiple times <laughs> i should come up with a new word but it is very matter of fact with the odd choice that i, I don't love and I, i'll discuss that in a minute but what i mean by that is is very much just shooting the people participating in the pageant behind the scenes we see their beauty treatments and their dress rehearsal and we see the ups and downs of them just interacting with each other so we see moments of them being very supportive and we see moments of them being very catty and judgmental. I'm going to talk about Rachel Harlow because she is significant to the documentary. She does win the pageant and it is quite clear that the filmmakers intended for us to follow her 
we see how she loses her wig and there's lots of like fuss and then there's <laughs> there's the end bit i will talk about it but we see how people kind of respond to rachel being so young and participating in the pageant so there's like comments about how she's never had to work for it because she's pretty much won pageants like right off the top when she came into it the film kind of creates this narrative where we are following rachel over other queens so we do see them they do like talk to the camera and they discuss their lives and we see them getting ready and doing their dress rehearsal and doing their catwalks but she's like the main focus and i think the reason why they chose to send her is specifically because of the ending now <laughs> if you have watched the documentary what you will probably find and what what is probably the most iconic moment of it mainly because it seems to be the point in the documentary where it seems to kick up in action like right at the end crystal labasia very iconic um drag queen and trans woman we see that she walks off when she is named runner-up and after the contest once rachel has won because rachel does win she gives this like speech about how rachel didn't deserve to win and how the judges don't have any taste and that the contest was fixed now like i said this is a very iconic moment people praise this moment people remember this moment but within the context of the documentary i think it was a disservice to Crystal and to Rachel, to be honest, to tack this onto the end when we haven't been following both of them. Like we've really only been following Rachel. So the way that this is framed is that Crystal is just having a hissy fit and being incredibly cruel to the winner. When in fact, what Crystal LeBeige is talking about is that it's incredibly difficult for black people to win these competitions which would have been mostly white it does the documentary a disservice to not focus on both of them as queens but it frames crystal as just this very angry black woman who is just being cruel for no reason when she's she's expressing legitimate anger at potential racism of, the, of this competition. What I learned from an article in Rolling Stone is that due to the racism endemic to the drag pageant scene, Crystal LaBeija eventually left the culture preserved in the documentary behind and became a legendary mother in the ballroom scene. So what I also learned is that Crystal was one of the few queens to win queen of the ball at mostly white events. So she was very kind of revolutionary in this scene. She went on to like organize balls for black queens. She even created her own house. They would be like safe havens for displaced queer youth. To like sum up, a major issue with this documentary is it is hindered by the fact that it it doesn't want to get involved it's presenting itself as very objective but in doing that it kind of it sands down the edges of what's very interesting dynamics of these pageants in a better world this would have looked at crystal and rachel equally and i'm sure a more skilled filmmaker would have been able to explore the dynamics and place that kind of end diatribe that crystal gives in context because out of context it's not fair to her she just looks angry and bitchy for no reason and there are legitimate concerns <laughs> that she's raising so the limitations of this kind of documentary are ultimately its perspective it's fairly obvious that it's a very white perspective and i know like hindsight is 2020 i can like can go over the stuff about how this documentary could have been made better i do think it's important to remember that documentaries are not objective truth and the filmmakers even unconsciously have an agenda when trying to tell a story with real footage with archive footage so when watching stuff like this and you see crystal labasia getting very angry about not winning and <laughs> your immediate thought is like well why is she throwing a hissy fit instead of what were the circumstances that led up to that i think everyone should study film studies even just a little bit just because i think it gives you like the critical skills to look at stuff like that and not simply be sucked in you know to have the skills to be like what are the filmmakers trying to convince me of now for the most part they're trying to present the drag pageant 
as objectively as they can. And, you know, this is done fairly well, I guess. I did find it very objectifying in places, you know, there was zooming in on people's crotches and stuff, which felt very violating. It is worth just considering what do straight cis white people have to gain from presenting one gay and trans people in this particular way to black women in this particular way what kind of ideology is it trying to uphold would you like to be a real girl if you could have that sex change if you had the money or you could get it done free well i uh, have enough money to go through the sex change and i live only 30 miles from john hopkins but it's the last thing i would want I know that I'm a drag queen, I've been a drag queen for a long time, I've been gay for a long time. But I certainly do not want to become a girl, even if I, I could have a baby. Well, my husband is in the service and he's in Japan now. And um, even if I could have a child, I wouldn't want to have the operation. I know I spent like a good chunk of that really kind of berating the documentary. I don't want you to think that it's because I don't like it. I actually really do. I think it's incredibly important to watch stuff like this and understand where modern art forms have had their roots. And I think it's amazing that we have this at all, something visual that concretely proves that drag has been a part of culture for a very long time. It didn't just suddenly pop into existence. So I'm about to do what I did in a previous episode where I just give you a lowdown on the history of drag. So I'm not gonna cite every time I reference someone else, but I will put all of my links in the show notes, just so you know that this section isn't coming from me. I have in fact done research. I just wanted to give sort of some background on drag as an art form. Drag, what I mean by drag, is someone of one gender donning the clothes of another gender, usually for the sake of performance, has its roots in theatre. And this goes like way, way back, all the way to Shakespeare. But for a more like modern historical breakdown, here is what I've found out. As dressing up in public, became more dangerous. Fledgling 19th century queer communities naturally sought to circumvent new laws. Some of the earliest, albeit suspect, information we have about explicitly queer drag dates back to 1893. Laws criminalising cross-dressing spread like wildfire across the United States in the mid-19th century. New York's, dating back to 1845, was one of the oldest. It declared it a crime to have your face painted, discoloured, covered or concealed or be otherwise disguised while in a road or public highway. I mean, that's just vague enough to criminalise queer people, isn't it? Jesus Christ. <laughs> you, can't even, you can't even have your face painted like Spider-Man or you get arrested. It's fucking abhorrent. <laughs> During the middle of the 20th century, the gay scene retreated into the shadows, governed by mob control and harshly policed by the city. By design, drag became political. It also became a huge countercultural influence in the late 1960s, which is where this documentary comes in. The Queen puts a lot of emphasis on the musicality of drag, so it's not just about the dresses and the makeup and the wigs. It's very much about being able to perform, usually music. So we see the theatre and show tunes influences. There's a number in the film where they're singing Grand Old Flag, which is an American patriotic song, which might sound odd, but there is this kind of reappropriation within queer culture. They will take stuff that has been like stamped into tradition and kind of break it apart so a lot of drag will draw on subverting or very much adhering to strictly to um classic forms of beauty so like blondness and this kind of ostentatious dressing style and this appropriation of american patriotism american <laughs> idealism and in this instance that will be drawing from the 1950s a very staunchly heterosexual time at the same time there is this emphasis on expression over identity so there are many cis men in this documentary who very much assert that they don't want to transition they don't want to be women they just want to wear the dresses and do the makeup and put on the wigs. At the same time, there are many 
trans women in this documentary. They aren't acknowledged really as trans women. I know that Rachel Harlow is dead named quite a few times in this documentary, which is to be expected, I suppose. It's not great, but it's not surprising either. But there is this kind of like harsh line between cis gay men who want to do drag and trans women who want to do drag. And considering I am going to have to talk about him later on, I do think it is important to bring up transphobia in drag and specifically talk about RuPaul. I think I would be doing a disservice if I didn't bring it up because a lot of the same problems in drag culture haven't actually gone away. So there's been this very harsh line drawn between cis and trans drag performers where previously trans women have not only been a major part of drag but have often been the foregrounders of it. I mentioned Crystal LaBeija before, who was both a trans woman and also incredibly influential in the drag scene. It is incredibly sad when I have to talk about people like RuPaul who have made awful comments about trans women. I gave um, a content warning at the beginning of the episode, but I am about to recount a bunch of transphobia. So I'm gonna give another one to just be like, hey, more transphobia incoming. RuPaul did an interview with The Guardian. He basically, he admitted that he probably wouldn't have admitted transgender women, specifically the performer Peppermint, who is an iconic New York City drag performer who made the finals in season nine after coming out as trans on the show. She probably wouldn't have been admitted if she'd already started gender affirming surgery. And he went on to say, you can identify as a woman and say you're transitioning, but it changes once you start changing your body. It takes on a different thing. It changes the whole concept of what we're doing. This response immediately sparked a wave of disappointed anger with several overlapping communities. Drag Race fans, the show's former contestants, trans and otherwise, and the trans performers. Peppermint, who spoke after her season about being worried that she wouldn't belong on Drag Race after coming out, and was relieved when it seemed to be a non-issue. In response to growing backlash, RuPaul doubled down with an ill-advised tweet. This tweet is probably the thing that most people remember rather than the interview. So he said, you can take performance enhancing drugs and still be an athlete, just not in the Olympics. Less than seven hours after his controversial tweet, he reeled his words back and apologized, which is pretty Good, I'm glad that you did that. So he said, I understand and regret the hurt I have caused. The trans community are heroes in the shared movement. And he said, you are my teachers. In her response, Peppermint called the apology an important step, emphasizing that women should not be defined by what surgeries they have or haven't had, and that gay men do not own the idea of gender performance. In terms of kind of the historical context of this debate, the line between drag performer and trans woman hasn't always been as concrete as it seems to be today. So what RuPaul was asserting was that in order to be a drag performer, it needs to be an identity that you can take off. Like if you're still a woman underneath the drag, then that's not real drag. He is wrong about that. Just from historical context, he is wrong about it. That's not what drag is about at all. Over ensuing decades, lines between drag, cross-dressing and transgender identification has been blurred significantly. As minstrel shows gave way to the rise of vaudeville and radio, drag drifted away from the mainstream to become a staple of gay nightlife, bringing with it a new paradigm for queer identification. In How Sex Changed, A History of Transsexuality in the United States, Joanne Myrowitz notes that the 1950s female impersonator community served as a safe haven for prospective trans women to sort out their gender issues. Further on from this, modern trans women who do drag, such as Peppermint and Juku, have both expressed how doing drag allowed them an opportunity to experiment with gender before they came out, before they realised they were trans women, and that often the first steps to discovering transness is by experimenting with gender expression as a teenager. They also both fully assert that trans women are incredibly influential and important to the creation and also the continuation of drag. Drag as an art form has its roots in transgressing hetero and cis normativity, in playing up the stereotypes of gender in this document that would be femininity and 
that in order to do this it is not necessary for you to be cis and that in fact trans women have been some of the biggest influences in the way drag culture currently looks if this documentary were to be made today i would hope that it would be made by queer people one and that it would take on the nuances of identity and whilst not conflating being trans and doing drag not fully separating them either i think the version of this documentary today looks like fortunately or unfortunately depending on your perspective is rupaul's drag race Three of us are dancers and choreographers. It's me, Rosé, and Joey J. But outside of drag, I am a professional choreographer for both dance and figure skating. So I really want to take this delegation role. I know what I'm capable of, and so I am not backing down. I told you we were going to talk about him. So we've talked about his controversial opinions, which, you know, he has apologized for. At the same time, we do need to talk about how influential he has been. Would modern drag culture look the way it does without him probably not whether that's a good thing is up to you but i <laughs> i am not a drag race fan for many reasons the main one being i don't like reality tv just at all even if it's something that i'm incredibly interested in i find it grating particularly the american kind and often incredibly cruel for no reason i could do a whole podcast episode on why i hate reality tv but that's that's not what this podcast is about so we'll stick to the subject matter which is queerness in in this instance drag i wanted to have that perspective though i can't be a good podcast host i can't talk about this documentary without talking about how it has manifested in today's world and in today's world that is drag race like it just is so i i watched a random episode and it truly was random i picked the latest season that was on netflix which was season 13 and to be fair to the show i picked the highest rated episode on imdb just so i was getting like the best version of this show because I'm, I'm already biased. I don't like this kind of manufactured conflict. And I don't like watching people argue. Like, I just don't. It's not interesting to me. If this show was about 20 minutes shorter and was just about the queens preparing their outfits and their makeup and then doing their catwalk, I would love it. Because there are genuine moments of this episode that I watched that I did love. And I loved watching the outfits come together. I loved the end outfits. I thought they were great. And I was very endeared to a lot of the performers. In the same way with The Queen, the documentary, there is this kind of camaraderie between the people on the show. And they make sure to emphasise that, you know, through talking heads. And we get to know them as people, which I think is something that the documentary was lacking. It was very much... Here's the show, end. The fact that I know the queens from the documentary is through my own research. I mean, I obviously know Crystal because who could forget her, but yeah, we don't get to know the queens as individuals in the documentary where we do, we do here. Unfortunately, <laughs> a lot of the quote unquote drama of the show comes from just people talking behind people's backs. You. <laughs> If you've ever watched reality TV, and I, I did a lot as a teenager, mainly because I had nothing else to do. If you've ever watched reality TV, you'll know, it, particularly on competition shows, there'll be, there'll be many people who will say many times that they didn't come here to make friends and that they're, they're going to they're gonna be the ones that win. I know this is going to sound like very wanky, but I just, I like when people just get on. I don't want to watch shows like this because I don't need more stress in my life. I don't care about the arguments that these people are having with each other, really. And they feel false. Sometimes I wonder if it's just the American way of talking, but the conflict that occurs in the show, specifically this episode, feels false. Because, spoilers for season 13, episode 3 of Drag Race, no one gets eliminated. So the conflict is truly manufactured because all they had to do was work together on their dance number and, you know, they would have been safe. I, I don't like drama. The show isn't for me, but what I will say is I fully understand why people love it. It's very quippy. Everyone has, like, 
a pun to say everyone's on the ball everyone knows what show they're on and they know that in the same way that putting together the outfits and doing the catwalk and doing the lip syncs is the performance so is the bitching behind people's backs and doing the puns and being the most you can be because that is part of what gets people to root for you I will say RuPaul is very much a personality in the show, which seems like an obvious statement, but with the Queen, we barely even see the judges, whereas the judges in this show, we know them by name, we see them, they talk amongst each other, they talk to the Queens, and yeah, I think that in building up a rapport between the Queens and the judges, you know, it gets you invested, and I think that's a major flaw of the Queen. I think because it's so dry, and because it's just trying to, like, be matter of fact, it is hard at times to stay invested, even if I do think it's a very important documentary. So, my verdict on RuPaul's Drag Race is that I still don't like it, but I was able to sit through the whole episode right till the end, and I didn't even pick up my phone. I don't think that's a very good endorsement of the show, because I definitely could have. Yeah, I'm probably not gonna watch Drag Race at any point soon, but I understand its appeal, and I think whilst I have reservations about it, the mainstreaming of drag has allowed people to understand it better. Whilst I don't love that it's kind of separate from its historical context, which is why, you know, RuPaul was able to make transphobic comments, specifically because he didn't seem to understand the origins of drag. Whilst I don't love that, I think just there being more of a reverence for this kind of art form and gender expression is important. I'm glad that people understand drag a little bit. I wish there was more stuff about it that is in Drag Race. I wish more people would seek that stuff out, but, you know, still important. Does it look like a badger? Well, <laughs> so I've been very critical of this documentary and I think as I've been talking about it I've just become more and more critical because I've noticed major flaws in it. So whilst I still like it I do think it kind of does look like a badger. So I will just reiterate all the points that I've been kind of railing against this documentary. The fact that it's very dry and matter of fact means that we don't get to know the queens in depth particularly crystal who i think it would have been incredibly interesting to know more about i think this unwillingness to reckon with race or just not even unwillingness just ignorance towards race kind of made the ending seem like crystal was being ungrateful when in fact she was probably just angry that she wasn't getting a fair shot in the way that the other queens were. The camera at times was a, a bit pervy, which I just didn't like. You know, I talked about it before. You know, the, there is this kind of false idea that drag is inherently sexual and the fact that the camera on occasion will zoom up on someone's ass or someone's crotch is just it's very violating and probably not what the queen signed up for even if they might have done a particularly sexualized performance that's not what this pageant was about they didn't consent to that kind of treatment from the camera i have lots of notes even with all that i still think it's very important i still think it should be a part of the conversation regarding drag recommendations i have two documentaries both of them are from pre-2000. For anyone who tells you that gay people just suddenly popped into existence and are demanding rights, they are wrong. We have been here for a long time. Both of these are American documentaries, only because I think within the context of the Queen, kind of expanding the knowledge of American queer culture is the goal of these recommendations. The first documentary is called Gay USA. It is a documentary about a series of LGBT protests that were going on across America in the 70s. They consist of archive footage of the protests along with talking heads. The filmmakers interview various cross-sections of the community, how they're enjoying the protests and yeah, they discuss their identities. I think it's just it's very interesting to watch what queer activism looked like before the AIDS crisis. The second documentary is pretty much essential and if you haven't watched it at this point, 
what are you doing? If people recommend you a LGBT documentary, it's probably going to be Paris is Burning. I did bring it up before. Paris is Burning looks at the perspective of ball culture in the 70s and 80s from the perspective of black and brown people who are often left out of these discussions. I talked about how the Queen pretty much erased all discussions of race. This film centres it. It's very much the focus and it's very comprehensive. It pretty much explains what ball culture is, how this relates to drag and gender expression, and there are multiple trans people in it, which is another identity often excluded from these kind of documentaries. Also, also, you will hear how many of the kind of customary terms that you will have heard of where they came from. So, like, throwing shade and reading, there are queens that specifically explain these definitions and how they how they function in these kinds of spaces it's incredibly interesting very well made and probably the most obvious recommendation i could give but very necessary if you haven't already seen it thank you very much for listening to this episode i have had a hard month i am still trucking though which is not a phrase I've ever said in my life. I don't know why I just said it now. We're halfway through this year, officially, and I've done six episodes now of this podcast. I am happy to keep going. I know that very few people listen to the podcast, but it's something that keeps my mind occupied and has been a good distraction from the kind of shit show <laughs> that has been my time being alive at the moment. So even if you don't like interact with this in a meaningful way. I'm glad that you listened to it if you did manage to make it to this point. I want to keep going. I should be back in July. I am intending to keep this going. The theme of that month will be queer fantasy slash sci-fi. So if you want to stay updated, make sure you follow me on Twitter at like a badger pod. Follow me on Spotify. Subscribe to me on YouTube. Read more of my work, please. You can find my writing at ambercomwalk.com. I published two pieces this month, which I'm very proud of considering. <laughs> I wrote about the 2021 release, We Are All Going to the World's Fair. I wrote a review of that. And I wrote an analysis of the 2019 film Vivarium for Gaily Helpful this year. Yeah, so you can go to my website and read those. If you'd like, if you feel so obliged, you can donate money to me, to my coffee which I'll put in the show notes. I've done a lot of research for this, so I'll put all my sources in the show notes as well. Thank you again for listening. I will, I will in fact see you in July. Bye.